immediate effects on the brain. There's things that have immediate effects on the brain. Look, it's not easy to sell insurance, right? But what I mean by that is I can tell you that things are going to have a cumulative negative effect on your brain over the long haul and it may register a little bit, but it's not going to really hit you that hard because you're not worried about what's happening in 10 years. You're worried about what's happening tomorrow. Well, I have five things that are going to affect you today. You're trying to have better brain performance. You want your brain to be healthy. Well, these kinds of things are going to stop that in its tracks and make it so you don't feel as sharp, period. Now, after today's video, I put a link to our sponsor, which if you're worried about protein availability, your gut does matter. So it is a relevant sponsor to have in this video. It's Seed, a daily symbiotic. It's the only probiotic that I ever recommend, the only one I ever talk about on my channel, and that's a 25% off discount link down below. So that link down below gets you 25% off their daily symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule for multi-stage delivery, which is really cool technology, but they're also on the forefront of the scientific research when it comes to the microbiome. So the microbiome plays a huge role in protein breakdown and potential absorption in our body as well. So it makes a lot of sense that if you're trying to get more out of your food, you would take care of your gut. So I think a good probiotic, more fiber, and taking care of your gut in the first place is a great place to start. And that link down below gets you 25% off that place to start. So check out Seed after this video. The first one is one that doesn't come as any surprise, and you're probably going to click off the video thinking I'm just a generic YouTuber talking about sugar, but sugar is pretty profound when it comes to immediate cognitive impairment. Why? Isn't sugar supposed to be brain energy? Well, yeah, the brain does run on glucose. Okay, but check this out. There was a study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for USA. It was a while ago, and it took a look at network stability. Now. Don't hate me for talking about keto for a second, okay? Because there's just a practical use of this. I'm not encouraging you to necessarily go keto. You can do whatever you want, okay? But this study specifically looked at how ketones affected the brain in terms of network stability compared to glucose. Okay, now let me outline what network stability is. Network stability, we have different regions of our brain, like the limbic system that has to do with emotions, the prefrontal cortex for memory, hippocampus, all these different regions. Well, they communicate with one another. Okay, the brain is not just the sum of all its parts. Like it communicates and that's what really matters and makes the orchestra that allows us to be what we are. Okay, well, what this study had demonstrated was that when ketones are present and glucose is lower, those regions of the brain were able to communicate with one another significantly better. See, I want you to think of it like this, okay? The brain regions whisper to one another. They talk very quietly, okay? And if it's a very quiet environment, they can hear the whisper. For lack of a better way of saying it, the CT scans and the fMRI scans within the study had demonstrated that when glucose was not super high, there was less noise, right? And the regions were able to communicate effectively. But when they gave them 75 grams of glucose, which is a lot for one sitting, yeah, but I mean, that's like a soda, right? A couple sodas. Well, it was significantly impaired. What I mean by that is it got super loud and super fuzzy, and all of a sudden the regions of the brain were not able to communicate with each other. So you had the independent parts of the brain just doing their thing, but not communicating with the rest of the brain so you have this cohesive effect, thereby decreasing cognitive function dramatically in a very short time. Now, another study was published in the British Journal of Nutrition took a look at 803 participants, okay, and it took a look at ones that were like type 2 diabetic and some that weren't, and it found that when they were people that typically consumed sodas, they ended up scoring significantly less on neuropsychological testing. Now, correlation does not equal causation, but we have to kind of connect the dots. That's a lot of glucose coming in at once. Let's move into the second thing that has to do with carbohydrates that can affect your brain, because this is really fascinating stuff. And in case you're wondering about diet sodas instead of regular sodas, I'm going to talk about diet sodas later in this video, because it's a specific subset we need to address. And you're probably wondering if they're better or worse. We'll get there. Okay, so with refined carbohydrates and specifically gluten, there is very clear evidence that it affects the brain. And gluten is not one of these things that's just like, trendy to get out of your diet. There is evidence. It's just, of course, there's a lot of money in the weed industry, right? We have to kind of factor that stuff in. Maybe that science doesn't get out there. I don't know. I'm just a guy on the internet. But the British Journal of Nutrition had published a study first that took a look at four groups of kids, okay? And they gave these kids four different kinds of breakfast. A low glycemic index breakfast, a low glycemic load breakfast, high glycemic index breakfast, and a high glycemic load breakfast. What they found is that a higher glycemic load, like a larger amount of aggregate carbohydrates, did give them like more immediate energy. However, if you look at the low glycemic index group, 
they ended up having significantly better verbal memory. Okay, so they were able to communicate and have better just overall memory than the groups that had more carbohydrates or higher glycemic carbohydrates. They also found the lower glycemic group, so less of a spike, ended up being less nervous and less erratic, which coincides directly with that National Academy of Sciences study too, that showed that when glucose was there, the brain operated erratically. It has to do with how much we're absorbing at one point into the brain. The brain likes glucose, but it doesn't like it in a ridiculous bolus like this. But now let's talk specifically. Do you ever feel foggy and weird when you're having gluten? Think about it. Maybe you're having so much gluten that you don't realize it. There's reasons that people have written books about this stuff. Okay, it has to do with something called zonulin. But let me touch on something else. 10% of the population are already intolerant to gluten outside of celiac. That's not factoring in the couple percent that have celiac disease. Okay, so 10% don't respond to, to gluten well. They have an inflammatory reaction. The rest are on a continuous scale up to that point. So you could be almost clinically intolerant, but still be having a lot of issues, but not be on the clinical scale. So it's on a sliding scale, it's on a continuous scale up to that. Personally, I feel like dog crud when I have gluten, like terrible. Right? I know it, I know, I call it, I've been glutened. I know if I go to a restaurant, and I, I just feel it, right? It has to do with this thing called zonulin, which is a protein that is in the gut barrier. Okay, and when zonulin is activated, it decreases the gut permeability, which allows lipopolysaccharides and other pathogenic bacteria to enter into the gut, triggering an inflammatory response to combat the foreign particles. Well, guess what? Study in biophysical research communications shows that we have zonulin in our blood-brain barrier, which protects our brain from pathogenic materials. So when zonulin is activated, we increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier as well. So that means, guess what? Particles are going into the brain. Specific brain inflammation. Then we have a whole different thing operating in the body outside of the typical self-contained immune system in our body. Now we are affecting the one in our brain makes a little bit of sense. If you're gonna have snacks, if you're gonna have starches, it's not the end of the world, but have them be lower glycemic and try to get gluten out of the equation. So carbs, 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 carbs. This guy is clearly just a keto evangelist and he's just trying to tell us exactly what to do with keto. No, I'm not, okay? Because guess what? Fats are bad too. So what should you eat? Air, air sandwiches and water with a little bit of salt. No, seriously, vegetable oils though. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about high omega-6 oils, which are just everywhere. Sunflower oil, we've got soybean oil, we've got canola oil. Well, what's the deal? Well, when you look at a study that was published in the journal Nutrition and Gerontology, it's kind of interesting because it took a look at rats and it gave them a high amount of omega-6s kind of similar to what we would typically eat in America at least. Okay, well they found that that increased the omega-6 levels within their brain. And what did that do? Well, what that did is that affected the neuronal membranes. So it made it so that the membranes were less fluid and there was less communication between the neurons within the brain. Once again, less network stability, but this is also happening within respective regions too. The neurons are just becoming kind of like, I don't know, almost just held up little hermits. They don't want to talk to other neurons and they're not really like getting the signals out. That's a big problem. We need more omega-3s in that case. I will say, fun fact, adding more omega-3s to the diet can cancel some of this out in terms of absorption. But let's talk a little more research here. They also found that it attributed to greater levels of amyloid plaque, which is associated with Alzheimer's. Okay, so we don't really want to like have that happen. But you might be thinking, well, this is Journal of Gerontology and talking about rats. Who cares about elderly rats? Seriously, does anyone? But no, when you actually look at the human studies, there's 14 additional human studies that have confirmed this same data. So, eh. Let's talk about more fats, trans fats. We can talk about trans fats in two ways. The first way is when you consume trans fats, they impair your overall glucose metabolism within the brain. They basically trigger poor glucose utilization and studies have demonstrated that there's reduced gray matter, like a reduced volume of gray matter indicating brain atrophy. Well, let me give you a quick thing that you can do to kind of reverse this a little bit. The same study had demonstrated that if you add a bunch of soluble fiber and fiber just to your diet, that can actually improve gray matter volume. So maybe there's a little bit of a way around that. Doesn't mean you can go eat your double quarter pounder with a bunch of trans fats and then substitute a little bit of chia seeds instead of mayonnaise and you'll be fine. But it does mean if you add some soluble fiber, you can a little bit reverse it. Anyway, let's continue. The other study is just something really interesting down a different direction. The Asian Journal of Andrology had found that trans fat consumption decreases testosterone levels 
Okay. Well, this is confirmed with other studies that demonstrate that trans fats also decrease sperm count and yada yada. But brand new study as of April 2021. This one was published in the Frontiers of Aging Neuroscience, and it found that lower testosterone levels were also correlated with lower cerebral glucose uptake levels, meaning testosterone plays a bigger role than just building muscle. It actually helps regulate how we use glucose within the brain. Now the one you've been waiting for, aspartame. Can you drink your diet soda instead of a regular soda? Let me just get off my high horse for a second and be real. I would rather you have a diet soda than a regular soda. Some people might just cream me for that, but I would rather you have a toxin that has a short-term effect than have a toxin like sugar, and I call it a toxin, say what you want, but in the abundance that we have it, it is, that also has a metabolic effect downstream. That being said, aspartame is wild because it has three ingredients, one of which is something called phenylalanine. Okay. Phenylalanine, per the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, can cross through the blood-brain barrier, increasing brain levels of phenylalanine. Well, then phenylalanine competes with other amino acids. What happens then is those amino acids that would normally support neurotransmitter function in our brain, serotonin, dopamine, all the feel-good stuff, all the energy stuff, well, they don't get to feed those neurotransmitters because phenylalanine is there enjoying the party. It came in and it said, nope, you guys go away. So it absolutely affects how we feel and affects our brain function. There was another study that took a look at kind of how much and how it would have an effect. And it was published in Research in Nursing and Health. Okay, it took a bunch of people and for eight days, it either had them consume low amounts of aspartame or high amounts of aspartame. The high amount being like 200 milligrams. They found it just took eight days for the high group to see significant impairment in cognitive function and increased levels of depression. Okay, that's pretty much in line with how I would feel when I was pounding like six Diet Cokes or Diet Pepsis a day. Pretty realistic. Now, a standard soda is gonna be like 180, 190 milligrams of aspartame. That's pretty darn close to the 200 grams, milligrams, excuse me, of the upper level in this study. You drink a plastic bottle of soda, you're over that 200. So a soda a day, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely gonna keep your brain away, but point is, is that when you look at all these different things, these are things that are going to be immediate effectors of your brain. They are going to affect how you feel. Can you get them out of your diet entirely? Yes. Is it realistic that you're gonna always have them out of your diet? Maybe not. You're gonna have things that you know trickle in, but if you make a concerted effort, it can make a big difference. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.